Our message for this morning is in Christ alone, in Christ alone. And with that, uh, please join me as we begin with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven above, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what we have in him. And we thank you for inviting us to be in him, Lord. Father, as we open your word this morning, as we uh, study it, I pray, Father, that your spirit that inspired the scriptures will come and instruct us now. I pray, Father, that you will uh, uh, take over my tongue, that you will speak through me, that you will speak to me, that you will speak to your people, Lord, and that you will turn this message into uh, a message of life to those, Lord, who, uh, who know you and who are still seeking for you. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as I, uh, as I already said, um, the title for the message is In Christ Alone, In Christ Alone. Now, when reading the Bible, especially the writings of Paul, you will often come across the phrase, in Christ, uh, in Christ. He talks about Christ in you, and I've spoken about this topic many times in the past, but uh, he also talks about uh, us being in Christ. The term is used over 130 times in the New Testament in its uh, various forms, like in Christ or in him or in, in his son and, uh, and so forth. So obviously it is important to understand what it means and how it affects our understanding and our view of, uh, of the gospel and of salvation. You see, uh, the more I talk uh, to Christians about the plan of salvation and how we are saved, the more I'm concerned about how many of uh, God's people understand the gospel and understand the plan of salvation. <clears throat> I, know, um, I know there is a lot of uh, cheap grace and false gospels out there. There is a lot of uh, save me, but don't change me theology. A lot of uh, give me your hand and, and say this prayer and you'll be saved. It doesn't matter how you live your life and, and so forth. There is a lot of uh, um, theology that does away with, with God's law. It does away with God's standards and it does away with God's will uh, for us on, on how to live our lives. I understand all that and I know the dangers out there. But make no mistake, this does not justify and it does not give you the license to change the gospel. Because of the false gospels out there, many sincere Christians have attempted to raise the bar of salvation more than God has, has said it. Uh, the mistake they do is they confuse the condition of salvation with the fruit of salvation. Here is how I think they, uh, they reason it in their mind. Uh, first is uh, the, the gospel, according to the Bible, teaches that if you accept Jesus, if you believe on Jesus, you will be saved. And of course, it tells us that because you are saved, when you are saved, Christ will live his life in you. Hence, it will lead you to a righteous behavior. It will change your behavior. Now, the false gospels out there is accept Jesus believe on Jesus and you will be saved, which is true, but it adds to it or it dilutes it or it changes it by saying, but, but you know, it, 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 God will not change your life. He will not change your behavior. You can keep sinning and keep doing whatever you want to do. It, it doesn't matter. God will save me, but he will not change me. Now, these two are, are, are out there, but as a result of the false gospel, many concerned uh, uh, Christians have come up with a concerned gospel. I have called it a concerned gospel because they have come to believe that uh, if you accept Jesus and if you change your behavior, you will be saved. Accepting Jesus plus changing your behavior will lead to your salvation. Now, uh, because of this concerned gospel, Many have uh, missed the simplicity of salvation as it is found in Christ Jesus. And as a result, they are going about to establish their own righteousness, which is of the law, or of them keeping the law, or of them doing good works, of them reforming their lives. Don't get me wrong. You will keep the commandments. You will live a reformed life. 
you will live a life in harmony with the will of God and in harmony with, with God's uh, uh, desire for you. But that will be the result of your salvation, the result of the work that God will do in and through you. You will not be saved because you do these things. You will do these things because you, will be, you are saved. You see, uh, the, the, the be good message, the be good gospel that says do this and do that in order to be saved uh, will lead people to one of two things. Either it, it will lead a person to, to say, you know what, I've been there, I've done that, it doesn't work. Christianity does not work. I've tried it, I've agonized, I strived, and I just couldn't do it. Or it will lead to the other extreme where it will, it will turn you into a Pharisee. It, 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 it will lead to pride because, you know, I, I can do this. I have done it and uh, so forth. The, the rich man, a rich young ruler came once to Jesus and, and he said, good master, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus told him, uh, why callest thou me good? There is none good but God. There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandment. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. And he, that's a rich young ruler, answered and said unto him, Master, all these things have I observed from my youth. So in reality, Jesus told the man, there is none good but God. And the man's reply was, I'm good too. You see, the gospel is, uh, uh, is very clear. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, based on the scriptures alone, and for the praise and the glory of God alone. It is not by grace and works, by faith and works. The gospel does not teach faith plus works equal salvation. Let me actually put it up on the screen for you. It does not teach faith plus work equals salvation. No, the gospel teaches faith equals salvation and works. Because you are saved, you will change, your life will change and so forth. You see, your theology makes a big difference. It makes a big difference in, in the way, it makes a big difference in, in, in the way you view your life and in the way you live your life and, uh, uh, and so forth. I, I know that by experience. You see, many years ago, I, like many, did and still do, used to think that my job as a preacher, my job as a pastor is to encourage people to do what they do not want to do, to live for Christ when they do not want to live for Christ, to live a righteous life when they do not really want to live a righteous life. But I have come to realize by experience that this does not work. You see, Christianity and the gospel is not aimed to get people to do what they do not want to do. No, the gospel has the power to change people internally and cause them to want to do those things that are pleasing in the sight of God. And I believe that the term in Christ that is found so many times in the scriptures, the term in Christ highlights the gospel, it highlights the grace of God, and it highlights what I'm trying to share with you. So today, I want us to look at and, and, and address three questions. First is, uh, what does it mean to be in Christ? And then, what do we have in Christ? And the third one is, what are some practical things I can do to be in and remain in Christ? So these are the three questions that we will address today. Now, before I start addressing these questions, I'm, I'm counting that you understand the gospel as it is revealed in, uh, in the two Adams. I've, I've dealt with it in, in many of my presentations. Actually, let me put some up here for you. Uh, I've dealt with it with uh, uh, the sermon called The Two Adams, another one called God's New Race, and another one called Righteousness by Inheritance. You can look them up and watch them. But in short, the, the gospel in, in, in The Two Adams teaches that if you have the life of the first Adam, you are lost. We are lost in Adam. And if we have the life of the second Adam, we are saved. We are saved in Christ. 
this means the first Adam, by his actions, lost eternal life. He lost his connection with God. And as a consequence of that, all of us who are born into this world are born separated from God because we are born of him and we inherit his life. We inherit the life of the first Adam. We are all born separated from God. However, the second Adam or Jesus Christ, by his actions, reconnected humanity with God and became the author of eternal life and eternal salvation to them that believe on him. Hence, all those who are born of him, all those who are born again, are born again connected with God and hence born again possessors of eternal life because we inherit the life of the second Adam. Paul says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. The whole human race is found in one of the two men. In one man, we are lost. In the other man, we are saved. Jesus also uh, said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We are born from our parents fleshly or carnal. And we were born again from the spirit, spirit or spiritual. So it boils down to one question. Whose life do you have? If you have the life of the first Adam, you are like him and you will live like him. Meaning you are carnal and are separated from God and you will live a carnal life. But... If you have the life of Jesus Christ, the second Adam, you are like him as well. And you, uh, you will live like him, meaning you are spiritual, you are connected with God, God, and you will live a righteous life. You will manifest righteous fruit. So this is the gospel as it is uh, uh, in the two Adams uh, in very short. But you can look up uh, these presentations that I mentioned and, and uh, study them in more detail. Now with this in mind, I want us to address the first question. What does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be in Christ? The first thing that the term in Christ means is that it is a status or a condition or a position you are in. To be in Christ describes the status, your status or your position. What do I mean by that? I mean that you are in a status or a position where in God's eyes and God's estimations, what is true of Christ is true of you what is true of christ is true of you you are in a position where god treats you as he treats his son he regards you as he regards his son all what jesus accomplished is credited to you and you are regarded righteous complete and perfect in him that is what paul says while talking about how how righteousness was imputed to Abraham because he believed. He goes on to say in Romans 4, it is written for us also to whom it shall be imputed, talking about righteousness, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. So if we believe in him, meaning if we put our trust in the person of Christ, if we have faith in the person of Christ, his righteousness will be credited to us. Notice Paul is not talking about if you have faith in an idea, in a theology, in a church, in a denomination. No, no. He's talking about having faith in a person. If you have trust in that person, the Bible says, Paul says, God will count the righteousness of Christ as yours. Notice also what Paul says uh, to the Philippians. He says, I want to be found in him that is in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. All what Paul desired, all what Paul wanted was to be found in Christ because righteousness is found in him. It is in his life. Paul did not want to chase the righteousness which is the result of, of keeping laws and observing laws and so forth. He tried it most of his life and he realized he came to the conclusion that it does not work. He wanted to have the righteousness that is the result of having faith and trust in the person of Christ. Notice what he says. For he has made him, God has made Jesus to be sin for us, 
who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Question. What sin did Jesus do in order to be made sin? Nothing. But by simply being separated from God, on the cross that is, he was made sin for us. That's what the verse means. He made him to be sin for us, meaning he was separated from him. Why? Um, so we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's what the verse says. What righteous behavior should I do in order to be made the righteousness of God? Nothing. By simply being united with God, you will be made the righteousness of God. Just like Jesus, by simply being separated from God, he was made sin for us. Us, by simply being re reunited with God, we will be made the righteousness of God in him. That is why it is in him, in Christ. Because unity with God, peace with God, and a relationship with God is only found in Christ. It is in his life. He is the one who did it, not me. So why will uh, you and me be made the righteousness of God by simply believing and having faith in Jesus? Because life is inherited. By believing on him, you enter into this status or this position where you are in Christ, where God grants you the life of his son and credits or imparts his righteousness to you. When, you've, when you view the gospel this way, uh, which is the way Paul and the other apostles viewed it, by the way, you will understand why Paul could say, we die with him and we rise with him unto newness of life. I mean, come on, Paul, what are you talking about? I did not die and I was not risen from the dead. Yes, I didn't. But if I'm found in him, everything that is true of him becomes true of me. Everything that he accomplished becomes my accomplishments. Notice, notice what, uh, what Paul tells us in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, talking about Jesus, he says, which he, that is God, wrote in Christ when he, that is God, raised him, raised Jesus from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. This is what happened to Christ. God raised him, Jesus, from the dead. He didn't raise me. He raised Jesus from the dead and he set him in heavenly places. Not me. He set Jesus in heavenly places, right? Now notice what Paul goes on to say in chapter 2. He says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. He has given, he has brought us to life together with Christ. By grace are you saved? And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. Are, are you understanding what Paul is saying in here? He's, he's saying that God raised us from the dead. God has given us life. God has made us sit in heavenly places together with Christ. In Christ. What are you talking about, Paul? God never raised me from the dead. I never died. I never went to heaven. It's true. That's what happened to Christ. And if you are in him, that is your reality now. What happened to Christ happens to you. What Christ accomplished is what you accomplished. Christ's reality becomes your reality. Why? Notice what he tells us. Because he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. What does that mean? That means that when you and I, when we are joined to the Lord, when we accept Jesus, when we receive him and we, be, we, we, we enter into him, when we accept him in our lives, we become one spirit with him, meaning we become one life with him. We receive his life and we live his life. Whatever is in his life is ours. If he has a righteous life, and I happen to think that Jesus has a righteous life, then I become righteous by simply believing on him. If he has been risen from the dead, then I be counted as quickened or risen from the dead because he has been risen from the dead and I have his life. You see, you receive the life of Christ who has been 
raised and is seated in heavenly places. And if this is the life that you have, then you are raised with Christ and you are seated with Christ because you are in Christ. What I'm saying to you is that God chose to save you in spite of you. He chose to save you without your help. He took you out of the way so he can save you in his son. In other words, <clears throat> when it came to the salvation of the human race, what God told the whole human race, he says, okay, now I want you to sit here on the side, get out of the way, and let me do it. And he sent his son in human flesh, and his son went ahead and accomplished salvation. That's why he cried on the cross, it is finished. It is done. It is accomplished. The will of God has been done in humanity in Christ Jesus. Not in you, not in me, not in the first Adam, not in the pastor, not in anybody, but in him, in Christ. And now when he raised him from the dead, God says, now if you want any of these blessings, just be found in him. I have saved you in spite of you. I have saved you in my son. Notice what Paul says in uh, <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophet. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon on them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, God chose to save you. God chose to make you righteous without the law. It's not my words. That's what Paul says. It is without the law. What does that mean? Meaning without the works of the law, without your obedience to the law. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Without your obedience to the law. God has chosen you. God, sorry, God has chosen to save you. God has chosen to make you righteous without your obedience your personal obedience to the law look if you don't believe me i mean don't believe me who am i believe paul notice what he goes on to say in verse 28 of the same chapter therefore we conclude that a man is justified what does justified mean it means a man is made righteous we conclude that a man is justified or made righteous by faith without the deeds of the law in other words, what Paul is saying, we conclude that you are made righteous simply by faith in Jesus Christ without your obedience to the law. I didn't write this. I'm simply reading it and trying to understand it. That's what Paul said. In the very next chapter, in chapter 4, he says, money paid to workers is not a gift. It is something they earn by works. But you cannot make God accept you because of something you do. God accepts sinners, or in the, in the King James Version, it says justifies the ungodly. God accepts sinners only because they have faith in him. That's from the CEV, Contemporary English Versions. Sinners do not become accepted with God because of what they do. No, it is only as they have faith in Christ. Why? Because when you accept him as your savior, when you put your trust in him, your faith in him, God considers you as one who, who is in Christ, meaning one who is covered by the blood of Christ, one who is found in him, one who is a member of his family, a member of that new human race that Jesus is the head of, that Jesus started, a new human race that is fully united with God, fully accepted with God. As one whose status is saved, whose status is reconciled. That is what it means to be in Christ. This is the first step of the gospel. It is the good news of your salvation. Notice what Paul writes to, uh, to Timothy. Who has saved us? Talking about God, he says, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus 
before the world began. The grace by which we are saved is given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. This is predestination, you know. God predestined to give his grace, meaning to impart salvation and eternal life to the human race in Christ Jesus. Not in you, not in your works, not in your obedience, not in your efforts, uh, uh, and most definitely not in whatever denomination or abomination you belong to. He predestined to save you and exercise and impart his grace to you in Christ Jesus. This way of salvation was predestined before the world began. You can change it, neither can you alter it. The only thing you can do is accept it or reject it. That is why you are saved the moment uh, you have faith in him. The moment uh, we are counted in him, the moment we choose to put our trust in him and belong to him, we are automatically accepted with God. That's what the verse says. He saved us, past tense, not according to our works. It's not because of anything you do. It is because of his grace which is found and revealed and manifested and imparted and given to you in Christ Jesus. And the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be where? In Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That is your reality in Christ Jesus. All that is true of Jesus changes all that was that is, that was true of you. These are my words, by the way. I'm not quoting anyone. As in, uh, it's not, I'm not quoting an inspired writer. Put it this way. All that is true of Jesus changes all that was true of you. His reality changes your old reality. You are no longer who you used to be. You are a new person and a new creature. That's what the Bible says. That's what God tells you. If you are in Christ, you are what? A new creature and all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You have a new life which gives you a new status and makes you accepted with God. Not because of what you do as a result of having this life, but because of your faith in Him. Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11, so you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, recognize your true self. Consider yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Your true self is that you are in Christ. So you will never be more true to the real new you than when you are pursuing Christ and seeking to be like him and letting him live his life through you. Because that is your reality and true identity now. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are no longer the old man who was without Christ. No, now you are in Christ. It's a new status that God has given us in Christ Jesus, without us doing any work, but simply by having faith in him, by trusting him. All things are become new, the Bible says, because what is true of Christ has changed what was true of you. What is true of Christ is become your new reality because you are found in him. Notice what Jesus says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed, is passed from death unto life. When you, believe, when you believe on him, when you give your life to Jesus, you automatically pass from death to life you automatically receive righteousness and eternal life. Why? Because you are found in him. Listen, don't believe me. 
I'm only asking you to believe Jesus. That is his word. That's what he said. Don't reinterpret it and add to it and change it thinking you are protecting the gospel from being uh, uh, diluted or from, from being watered down. Protecting it uh, 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 from the cheap gospels out there. Don't do that. The scribes and the Pharisees thought that by having all these laws and rules around God's laws and rules, they are protecting the law. And they ended up inventing a new religion. And so many Christians have done that. They went out of a, out of a, a good motive, out of a, a good heart. They wanted to protect the gospel and protect the, 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 uh, the, the fruit of the gospel. They went and, and uh, changed the gospel and raised the bar of salvation, thinking they are doing God a favor. Don't do that. Don't do that. Just accept the gospel as it is. Accept the beauty of the gospel let the grace of god melt your heart believe and you will live that is what jesus said and that is what paul said in romans chapter 10 he says if you shall confess with your mouth the lord jesus and believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead you will be saved he goes on to say for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved don't change it don't raise the bar. You can't raise the bar more than God said it. If that's what he said, that's what we believe. The gospel is not what did Jesus do. The gospel, sorry, it's here on the screen. The gospel is not what did Jesus do, now you go and do that. No, the gospel is what has Jesus done. Now believe that. That is what the gospel Believe what Christ has accomplished. Receive what Christ has accomplished. Don't go and try to reinvent the wheel and do what Jesus did. You can't. Just simply believe what he did and, and let the grace of God melt your heart. Look, think of it this way. If I put a letter in an envelope, wherever the envelope goes, the letter goes. Whatever happens to the envelope happens to the letter. For the letter to reach its destination, it needs to stay in the envelope. It needs to go where the envelope goes. In the same way, when I accept Jesus as my Savior, the Bible says that I am considered in Christ. I am in Him. Whatever is true of Him becomes true of me. And what I need to do is remain in Him because wherever He is, there I am. If he is seated in heavenly places, then guess what? You are seated in heavenly places. Why? Because you are in him. If he is righteous, then guess what? You are righteous. Why? Because that is where he is. That is what he is. So the first, the first meaning of being in Christ is it describes your status. Or position in the eyes of God which is yours the moment you surrender your life to Christ and put your trust your trust in him that is what it means to be in Christ read the Bible believe what it says uh, it's so many times in the New Testament the Christian is identified as one who is in Christ they're not mentioned by name but it's mentioned as to those who are in Christ Jesus that is your new identity you disappear you only become as one who is in Christ. That is your identity. That is your status. Now, the second meaning of, of the phrase in Christ is it describes a relationship or an experience that you have with him. Notice what the Bible says. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You don't only just stand still in him. You walk in him as well rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving it is not enough to understand and to know the status you have in christ saying this is my status is not enough it is the beginning of your salvation but it's not the end we need to walk in him to be rooted and built up in him meaning we need to have a strong relationship and experience with christ 
You see, when a tree is rooted in something, you will kill the tree by ripping it out of wherever the roots are in. And when a building is built on something, you will destroy the building by taking its foundation away. Paul uses this imagery or, or this analogy to express the strong connection and dependence we ought to have with Christ. <clears throat> this tells me that being in Christ leads to having an uninterrupted and unadulterated and unshakable relationship with him. The Bible admonishes us uh, uh, to call on Christ and also to follow Christ. It's not one or the other. It is both. One leads to the other. You can't call on him and not follow him. It doesn't work. You can't tell him, save me, but don't change me. It does not work. <clears throat> Please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying if your relationship or experience with Christ is shaking, it means that you are no longer in Christ. That is not what I'm saying. I've already dealt with, uh, with this topic in a presentation which I shared, I think, last Sabbath online. Uh, it's called The Faith of Abraham. Look it up and, and see it for yourself. God understands our weakness and our difficulties. Christ was one of us, and he was touched with the feeling of our weak flesh, the Bible says, of our infirmities. So no, God does not give up on you and you do not lose your status in Christ or your salvation by having weak moments and doubtful situation. So long, so long, you are continuing to walk with him. You continue to seek him. You continue to hold on him. The point is, being in Christ comes with an experience with Christ, a relationship with Christ. Jesus talks about a group of people who in the last days, will come to him and they will say, Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Obviously these people claim the status but fail to have an experience or a relationship with Christ. If you're going to talk to the talk, you need to walk the walk. Claiming the status is not enough. You need to live in Christ, abide in Christ. So to be in Christ refers to two things or means two things. One, it refers to a status we are in, we enter in when we accept Christ, which is the moment I get reconnected with God saved and enter into eternal life that is the moment when you believe on jesus when you accept him the bible says you become as one who is in christ <clears throat> meaning salvation is yours eternal life is yours whatever is christ becomes yours the moment you put your trust in him but it also means and refers to a relationship we have with christ which is the sustenance of our salvation the walk in this eternal life. We don't only enter and stand and stay in Christ, but we walk in Christ. Amen? <clears throat> now, this deals with the first question. What does it mean to be in Christ? The second question is, uh, what do we have in Christ? And I cannot possibly cover everything the Bible says of what is ours in Christ. But, but, but I will attempt by reading a few passages so you can see for yourself. In Ephesians 1, uh, verses 3 to 11, I highlighted the bits of it. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. <clears throat> in Christ, I am blessed with all spiritual blessings. 
I am chosen. I am adopted as a child of God. I'm accepted with God. I'm forgiven of my sins and have a glorious inheritance. All these things are mine in Christ. All these things are yours the moment you put your trust in him. You don't need to go ahead and prove yourself for two, three weeks or two, three years in order to obtain these things. No, these things are yours the moment you accept him. The moment you say, Lord, I repent, I give all to you. Come into my heart. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in, will sup with him and he with me. The moment you open the door by you repenting of your sins and giving your life to Christ, all these are yours. The Bible goes on to tell us <clears throat> in John, and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life and what? And this life is where? In his son. He that has the son has life and he that does not have the son of God does not have life. Listen, eternal life is found in the son. The moment you receive the son, eternal life is yours. Eternal life begins the moment you accept and receive Jesus. Your eternal life does not begin after you're risen from the dead or after Jesus comes back. No. Eternal life begins right now, the moment you accept Jesus. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly here on earth, here on earth and in eternity to come. Also, the Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are where? In Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In here, you have both. You have the status and the walk. The status, which is your condition, the moment you accept Christ and the walk, which you walk in him, that relationship, that not, uh, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit is referring to your walking with Christ, which, which I will now address in the, in the uh, third segment, which is in, <clears throat> in a couple of minutes. Uh, so no condemnation to you in Christ Jesus. That is what is yours in Christ. And also the Bible tells us, and you are complete in him. You are complete in him. The moment you are in Christ, you are complete. You are perfect in the eyes of God. There is nothing more that God demands. Just let him live his life in you. And all these things are found in Christ Jesus because it is found in his life. Believe it, my dear sister. Believe it, my dear brother. Do not doubt the word of God. Do not underestimate or overcomplicate the grace of God and the plan of salvation. It is simple. It is simple. Praise God for what we have in Christ Jesus. Now, the third and final segment that I will address is what are some practical things I can do to be in Christ? Like we hear all this terminology, you know, in Christ, be in Christ, have a relationship with him. I mean, it's beautiful and, and some people understand it, but many people don't. Like, what does that really look like in, in practical reality? What does that mean, man? Tell me what it means. I'm going to try. I hope I succeed, but I'll try. So we just saw all what is ours in Christ. We saw that by faith we receive Christ. But practically speaking, what does that mean? Notice this verse. which. You will think it's unrelated, but I'm going to bring a point out of it. <clears throat> God speaking to Joshua, he tells him, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given, notice, not I will give, I have given, I've already given it to you, just as a promise to Moses. Now, it, 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 it's a simple yet complicated uh, 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 promise. It's a beautiful, yet, 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 yet full of wars promise. I mean, it's a, it's a profound promise, yet what in the world are you talking about? I mean, they are still living there. Can't you see the giants? Look at everybody there. Everywhere, your foot will step. I have already given it to you. God promised Israel and Joshua that he will give them the land. As a matter of fact, he said, I've already given it to you. But his promise required an act of faith on their part. The land was theirs 
but they needed to walk there. They needed to get there. They needed to claim it. Wherever your footsteps are, I will give it to you. So even though God gave them the land, it did not become practically theirs until they walked to it. They didn't catch a cab there. They had to walk there. Meaning, they had to, to, to put their own effort in walking there and claiming the promise that was already given to them. Until they went and claimed it, it was not practically there. They could not eat of the fruit of the land until they got there. They could not live in the houses there until they got there. They could not till the land there and drink from the uh, rivers of milk and honey until they walked there and they claimed it. In the same way, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus, the Bible says. But we need to claim them. We need to possess them. We need to experience them. So practically speaking, what, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? The Bible gives three illustrations of what it means to be in Christ. Three practical illustrations that us as humans can relate to. And they are this. Let me share the screen. It illustrates, uh, illustrates the relationship with Christ as, as marriage. Sorry, ignore that verse at the bottom. I will come to it later. Uh, the verses are up on the screen. Paul says that I have espoused you unto one husband, Christ. He likens the church as a, as a bride and Christ as the husband. This tells me that to be in Christ means to love Christ, to spend time with Christ, to be loyal to Christ. Look at your partner, examine the relationship you have with him, and you will learn lessons of what it means to be in Christ practically. Because our relationship with Christ is likened to a marriage. You, you, you can't be in that marriage if you don't love your partner. It's a fake marriage. You can't be in that marriage if you don't spend with your partner. If you're not loyal to your partner, if you're not faithful to your partner, you, you can't have that God-blessed marriage. So that's the first illustration. The second illustration is, as the body and the head, uh, the verses again are there. Uh, we, the church, are the body of Christ, and he is the head. This tells me that we are to receive our instruction from Christ. We are to obey him and to be always ready to do those things that please him. But remember, you cannot do that while you are outside the body. You have to be a member in the body in order to hear what the head is saying to the body and to do that. So this illustration tells me there had to be a, a constant communication. You know, I'm moving my hands, right? Subconsciously, I'm moving them. But I'm moving them as a result of this head connected to this hand. And this head is sending signals to this hand and telling it what to do. That's what the relationship with Christ is lacking to, body and the head. You disconnect the body from the head, you don't have proper movements. <clears throat> you have a dead body. <clears throat> and the third illustration, which is my favorite, is the vine and the branches. And it's spoken by Jesus himself. And Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. All right. In this parable, Jesus beautifully explained what it means to be in Christ. First of all, we are to be and we have to be attached just like the branch is attached to the vine we need to be attached to christ we need to be united with him all the time you are his just like the branch is belongs to the vine you belong to him you are a member of his body also you receive just like the branch receives sap from the vine meaning we receive life and power from him he is the one who supplies your needs. He is the one who keeps you spiritually alive. And the third point is, you are used by him to bear fruit, just like the branch is used by the vine. You know the fruit comes from the vine, right? The sap, the source is the vine. The source is the vine and shoots fruit through the branch. And you are used by God to bear fruit, meaning it is 
He who wills and does and works in you, his life and, and, and his thoughts and his actions are to be manifested through you, through you. You are to show his glory. But the central point is that we are to abide in him. That's what Jesus kept saying. Abide in me and I in you. Abide in me and I in you. Well, what does that practically mean to abide in Christ? It means to continually walk with him. Practically, it means to always seek his will and do it. By this, I'm not saying memorize the Ten Commandments and go out and keep them. That is not what I'm saying. The Pharisees did that and they ended up killing Jesus. What I mean by it is have such a close relationship with him that you continually seek his will in your every day life, in everything you do. Seek to know what he wants you to do <clears throat> and what his will is for you. This is what it means to abide in Christ. We always say it means have a relationship with him. But what does this truly mean? I'll put it up here in the screen. This relationship is interpreted through my behavior in my everyday life. My relationship with Christ, my abiding with Christ is interpreted, is lived out, is practically practiced by my everyday life, by my behavior and decision of everyday life. Jesus said, the Father is in me and I in him. And he also said, the works that I do are not mine. He said, the words that I speak are not mine. He says, I always do those things which are pleasing to my Father. You see, Jesus knew the Torah, but so did the Pharisees. The Pharisees did not do the will of God. Jesus did the will of God. Because Jesus knew God. He walked with God. He talked with God. He sought the will of God in his everyday life. Meaning, in everything he did, he sought the will of God. Where is he to sleep? Where is he to go? What is he to say? What isn't he to say? What is he to do? What isn't he to do? It was through his behavior in the everyday life that Jesus abode in the Father. And the same with you and me. We abide in Christ. We walk in Christ through our behavior, which is manifested uh, uh, in everything, in all the choices we do and all the things that we do in every day. That is what it means to abide in Christ. Listen to me. You can spend years trying to theologically interpret and understand what it means to be in Christ and what it means to abide in him. But I'm telling you now, you seek to, de to do <clears throat> his will in your everyday life. And by the end of each day, you will realize that you have spent the day abiding in Christ. Stop concerning yourself with the big theological pictures and start living your life in the now and today with Jesus. Every moment counts towards your abiding with him and in him. Every trial you go through, every decision you make, everything you do counts. Why? Because all these things are opportunities for me to abide in him, to seek his will, to know what he wants me to do. <clears throat> Jesus says, <clears throat> if you abide in me and my words my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Jesus was not talking about the Ten Commandments when he said, my words abide in you. That's not what Jesus was referring to. If that's what you think Jesus was referring to, then you missed the point. He is talking about his personal words to you. The context is abiding with Christ, just like the vine continually, uh, the branch continually abides in the vine. It's a continuous thing. And in that context, he was referring to his words, not to his words that were written 4,000 years ago on stone and now revealed to you on, on, in, the, in the Bible and so forth. No, he was referring to his everyday words, his communication to you, his, his impressions that he, uh, uh, and his directions to you in your everyday life. In your every moment and every decision, he was 
uh, uh, he wants to reveal his will to you. That's what Jesus was referring to. He was not referring to a set of rules that you memorize and you obey and keep and live by. No, he was referring and he's still referring to his personal instructions to you, which requires an abiding, a relationship, a friendship, an experience, a communication with God and with Christ. It, it, it requires a, a hearing and a listening on your part to his voice to know his will. So how can you practically abide in Christ? Continually communicate with him to know his will about everything in your everyday life. You do that and I guarantee you by the end of the day you will realize that you have spent the day abiding in Christ. Listen, your life is made of years. And your years are made of months and your months are made of weeks and your weeks are made of days and your days are made of moments. To abide in Christ means to spend your moments with him. And every moment I'm making a decision about my work. Every moment I'm making a decision about my study. Every moment I'm making a decision about my friends, about my fun, about what to watch, about what to do, about what to eat, about everything all these are moments in my life that make up my life so you need to recognize what jesus said jesus said lo i am with you always even unto the end of the world he said i will never leave you nor forsake you you need to recognize that and as you recognize that you will you will understand that what jesus said by abide in me and i knew abide in me and my words abide in you he was referring to his communion with you in your everyday life it's not just about you abiding in christ on the sabbath it's not just about you abiding in christ when when you kneel to pray at the end of the day or the beginning of the day or when you read the bible and you have your quiet time no abiding in christ is about continually living with him it, you, you don't have to you know close your eyes and go in a corner in order to pray it's about every day lord should I get this? Lord, should I buy this? Lord, should I punch this man? Lord, what should I do? It's about everything in your life. That is what it means to abide in Christ. Talk to him like you talk to your friend. Love him like you love your partner. Listen to him like you listen to your head. These are the examples and the analogies that are given to illustrate the relationship with Christ. Marriage, loving your partner. Body and head, listening to the instructions coming and the vine and the branches continually connected with him that is what it means to practically abide in christ so i'm inviting you all including myself to abide in christ to have that personal relationship with him and when you hear me say these words i'm not talking about some big philosophical theological idea that is out there that has no practical application no i just told you what i mean by it i mean by it, it's your every moment of your life it's the every decision you make it's the everything you do it's the every place that you go take christ with you forget what i said recognize the christ is already with you remember what he said wheresoever your foot steps I have already given it to you. All these promises, all these blessings are found in Christ and they are already given to you in Christ. That is your status the moment you believe, the moment you accept him. You straight away, that, 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 that supernatural, uh, what's the word now? Uh, taxi, supernatural transfer from earth to heavenly places straight away the moment you accept jesus that, that that's what jesus said we are seated that's what paul said we are seated with him in heavenly places these are yours in christ jesus but my dear brother my dear sister you need to walk there you need to get your foot to step there you need to live that reality and i'm telling you how to live that reality daily commune with him it's not complicated it's not big it's not about big decisions it's about small decisions it's about little things it's about your everyday life the every little things that you do in your life that is that is what makes your big life it's the little things abide with christ in the little things and you will find out that you are abiding with christ in the big things amen
our time is up. I'll leave it at that. Let us close with a prayer and then we'll, um, we'll open the floor for any comments or questions. Our Father in heaven above, Lord, we thank you with all our hearts for uh, this privilege that you have given us to be in your Son. I thank you, Father, with all my heart for inviting us to have this relationship with your Son and with yourself. Lord, it is difficult for us as mere mortal humans to comprehend this closeness that we as mortals ought to have with the immortal God. Father, it is hard for us to comprehend it, but I pray through your spirit that you will open our eyes, that we can see how close you are to us, how close your son Jesus is to us, how, how low you brought yourself and your son Lord to come down to our level so you can walk with us in our everyday life. So as we, you walk with us here, you will raise us up to heavenly places. This is my prayer for each and every one of us here, including myself, Lord. May this, um, this truth becomes our reality and our practical experience is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.